over to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Almost a year ago with one of our politicians and I feel like there are people that are out of touch with real reality and I'll be honest because I made a mention to them about the increased suicides the mental health because of lockdowns and their thing is we need more programs I think we need more families we don't need, the problem, the reason we need more programs is because we have less family units. And everything we're doing is destroy the family unit. It's, you know, it doesn't have to be this, it doesn't have to be that. I have read testimony after testimony after testimony, and I've talked to individuals that says, we lacked a father, we lacked a mother, or we lacked a normal family unit of a father and a mother. And because of it, the conversation, Mothers are super women, but they can't be a male. There are things fathers cannot teach a kid that a mother does. But together, we are one. We are one in Christ, and therefore we can teach the feminine side and the masculine side. We can feed, we can feed this aspect of their life. We can feed this aspect of life. But you know, when you buy fertilizer, it's not all nitrogen, is it? I buy the fertilizer that's 19, 19, 19. It's got some phosph phosphorus, it's got this, now some of this, it's got some of that. It's an equal blend. Because they say sometimes too much nitrogen will kill it. Everyone needs, even my daughters, they know how to change some brakes. They know how to change some tires. Why? Ladies, how many times have you been beside the road in your life? In your life, uh, what do I do? And some of you go, my dad taught me. I learned how to change a tire. Do you know how many women are abducted? And this is from law enforcement I talked to while being on the side of the road. Folks, it's not the world you, many of you and I grew up in. It's not safe. I fear for my children and grandchildren if the Lord does not tarry. We heard a young man this week going to South Africa to the orphans. Do you realize one in three survive in Africa? 7,000 kids a day, or 7,000 kids a year are abandoned and die. And they're going to start orphanages there because they're abandoned. They're just thrown away because someone has a child and throw them on the side of the road. He said, if we can save 100 or 200, it really just touched my heart. Our world treats children like a throwaway. Oops, we had an accident, you know, a moment of fun. Let's just throw it outside. He's there thrown everywhere. The state-run orphanages are overfilled. It's not about being a parent anymore. It's about they're an inconvenience. That's what makes us a father. That's what makes us a mother is the children God gives us. And in Proverbs chapter 1, Solomon is writing... To his child, he says, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to uh, no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. 
For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thy heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. What, and I can read the whole chapter, and we're going to go through all of it, because this chapter is important. But I want us to stop and think about this. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Knowledge, wisdom. And this word wisdom here is called wisdom in a good sense. Skillful and wise thinking. We cannot teach enough common sense to our kids. Amen? This world killed common sense. Think about some of the things people are thinking as normal today. I'm like, huh? Common sense will tell you that is just impossible. But if you want to think that, jolly good. I'm not going to go down that road because my dad taught me to think with common sense. This is an important aspect this morning. Instruction of fathers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for instructing us through your word. Thank you for sending your son and giving us examples of wise living. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, to lead us and guide us in all truth and help us to discern between false and true. Lord, I thank you that you gave us this word, the word that is forever settled in heaven, the word that will guide us and be a lamp unto our feet. Use this message as you placed upon my heart this week to challenge, to convict, to encourage. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So many times we see things in this world that just shock us. Fatherless children are twice as likely to drop out of school. Children with father, fathers who are involved are 40% less likely to repeat a grade in school. 40% less likely. Children with fathers who are involved are 70% less likely to drop out of school. Children with fathers who are involved are more likely to get A's and B's in school. Children with fathers who are involved are more likely to enjoy school and engage in extracurricular activities. 75% of all adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. Ten times the average. A father factor in drug and alcohol abuse researchers at Columbia University found that children living in a two-parent house with poor relationships with their father are 68% more likely to smoke, drink, and use drugs. Teens in a single mother's home are at 30% higher risk than those with a two-parent two home. 70% of youths in state-operated institutions came from fatherless homes nine times the average. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children who show behavioral disorder and dyslexia, ADD, and it has a few other acronyms here, autism, come from fatherless homes. That is from the CDC. So I think that's a pretty reputable source. Sometimes. But you know, that's shocking. You know how many children are struggling with all the acronyms I just mentioned? I wonder if parents, and I've seen it and you've seen it, where fathers are so busy that they don't spend time with their kids. As they would call this, and this is it, families with a hardworking father who's never home, 71% of them or 71% of the children in that type of home will have anger issues. Why? Kids want to have a dad to sit down and play a mental game with. Take interest with them. Take them hunting. Take them fishing. Take them biking. Take them swimming. Teach them swimming. Teach them something with a car. Doesn't matter. They want to know they want to be there. I know how it is. Sometimes we do get tired. We come home, we don't want to be bothered with things. That's not the way we should be. 71% of pregnant teenagers lack a father. 
90% of all abortions come from fatherless homes. 90%. Sad. But these have been statistics that are all documented in the last 20 years. We live in a world that has made fun of fathers. We've seen Ted Bundy look like a moron. We've seen them attack the Leave it to the Beavers that we grew up on. And many other figures where fathers were considered for wisdom. Now they're Neanderthals. And now even if you have a normal family, they try to make it look out there. What a shame. And what they call was normal is abnormal because it goes against the laws of nature. We need to raise godly children as bastions of hope for the world. Children that will stand. Children that will be able to pass on the faith of our fathers, regardless if it's popular or not. If Paul can instruct, if Solomon can instruct, all we can do is instruct and pray and live. Every one of us has all unfortunately, picked or chose the knowledge we've learned with. And sometimes we look back and say, what was I thinking? That was sound wisdom. That was, but I was in my youth. And the Bible talks about, Proverbs talks about the folly of our youth. Sometimes we think we know better than that. Sometimes we think we know better than this. And we'll just go ahead and do it. And we'll come like, oh, I guess the old fellow was right. And we're like, wow, I guess mom was right. Mom Parents have an important job, and it's together. Like I said, there are things my wife teaches that I, I couldn't begin to teach. There are things I teach that my wife would, wouldn't know how to teach, and vice versa. There's things I'm, I'm proud of what my wife has taught our girls. But you think about what the Bible says here. The first thing I want you to see, I'm going to give you three things this morning. Instruction in the Word of God. He said... Uh, for I give you good doctrine. Notice that was the very first thing he said. If we do not, have I always been faithful in that? No. My family devotion has been a lot like a lot of other family, but hit and miss. But over as the years have gone on, I've realized the importance of it. It's not about the rules. It's about establishing that relationship. And not all churches teach this. And this is something over the years of pastoring. I have changed to focus on things that God would have me do it. Not on this, but on that. Not on, this is what I say, but what does God's word say? Where is God's word? Because this is what matters. When we stand before God, he's not going to say, well, what did Pastor Horton's doctrine say? No, he's going to say, what did my book say? And I better, as a pastor, align up with this book, or you might as well kick me to the curb. Because it's, you know, if I'm not teaching this book, we might as well have a hold down in the social club. Amen? But this is not the purpose of church. It's so that we can become instructed and grow together in unity of the faith. We read that this morning in Ephesians. Grow in unity of the faith. If we're not doing that, what's the purpose of church? Some are still trying to figure out the purpose of church. But I'm glad that the Bible tells us what the purpose of church is. But notice, when raising godly kids, use the word of God. They're not going to become godly. They're not going to become God-fearing unless they understand God's word. And forcing God's word upon them, enforcing our way upon them, it's like many other people says, I don't want religion. You know what happened? Their parents force religion on them. If their parents show them a relationship, you know, there's been so many cute poems and songs about how the children... I'm watching you. Children are mimics. We were laughing this week at some things that children do. You know, they mimic the parents. They see you pray, they'll want to pray like you. They'll see you hold your cup that way, they're going to want to hold that cup. They see you eating this way, they see you talking this way, they're going to, you know, people are like, where did they learn that from? Look in the mirror. You know, how did they learn that word? 
how do they do this? Look in the mirror. Let me tell you something. As a Sunday school teacher for several years, my wife and I, if you want to know anything about the parents, they may come in. We are super and Mrs. Saint. We are Mr. Saint. We are perfect. And then I get the kids. My mom and dad fought all the way to church. Pray for them. You know, any prayer requests? Yes, Tommy. Pray for my mom and dad. They were angry all the way to church. Boy, when they came to their pool, we, we're so glad to be here. And we're Tommy spilling the guts in junior church, you know. We were like, whoa, okay. And what do they see? They see what we really are. When we close that door at night, they hear mom and dad fight. They hear mom and dad curse. They hear mom and dad this. They hear no. Or they say, that's what I want to be like. And you know what they say? Girls tend to look for something like their father. God help me. <laughs> but you know, it is. They have a picture of what they want to be. This is where we need to be the mothers and the fathers that God would have us be. Use the word of God. Don't try to cheat children without it which will only lead them to rebelliousness. God knows children, and he knows what you need to do to bring them up right. Parents are either going to prepare their children to follow Christ or follow the world. They will be fascinated by Jesus Christ. Love your kids and be careful to follow God's instruction, which includes teaching them his word, disciplining them out of love, not provoking them, pray, praying with them, and being a good example. I'm going to read some quotes for you this morning. If we don't teach our children to follow Christ, the world will teach them not to. The best learning I had came from teaching, Corey Ten Boom. What a story that lady wrote. Mm -hmm. Children are great imitators, parents. So give them something great to imitate. Very good. If God is not first in your life, he will be last in theirs. That broke my heart. And that's true. If he doesn't see mom and dad getting up and reading God's word, if they don't see us praying or taking our needs to the Lord, will they take their needs for God? Teaching kids to count is fine, but teaching them what counts is best. Bob Talbot. ABC, one, two, three, that's great. But teaching them to count their blessings, even better. Teaching your child and I thought this was author unknown, but I think every pastor and every father has quoted this and seen this. Teaching your children that God's house is only relevant on Sunday morning will teach them that God is not really relevant at all, but a ritual you practice but don't live. Mm -hmm. I don't want church to be a ritual, and I know community doesn't either because I've got to know you over these last few years, and I know your heart. And many of us wish we could go back and hit rewind and go do it over because as we've grown in the Lord, we've seen things we messed up on, we things we've done good on, and we want to go back and say, I want to capitalize on that because that area was a success and that area was, eh, that area, of, you know, we've all been there. If I could go back and do some things, I would. But you know what I love about God? When we say, God, forgive me, I failed. It's in the past, and we need to live forward in faith. You know what? We can still teach and be grandparents, great-grandparents. The Bible is full of it. Respect your elders. Listen to your elders. Learn from your elders. We can still teach. You know why? I heard an example this week, and I about died laughing. And I'm sure I'm going to slaughter it because I meant to bring my notebook up here, and I forgot it. You say, well, I don't know how to serve as an example. You can always serve as a bad example, you know? And I, I laughed at that because, you know, I may not be able to give much example, but I can show you what bad examples look like and say, hey, don't do that. This is what I did, and it was dumb. We can always serve an ex as an example, even if it's a bad example. We can still teach. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Turn with me. A lot of scriptures this morning. But I want you to see what the Bible says, because that's what we base all of our matters of faith and practice on. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
Don't make your children angry. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do you make a walk with God a priority in your life? Standing up for God in your community or world is a moot point if you're not walking with God in the privacy of your home. I'll throw it down. You know, many Christians are social justice warriors. They, uh, and at home they do something completely different. What's really going to matter to the kids? How well you stand up for God out here with your mouth? Or you live with God with your feet in the house? What would you rather do? You know how many people are devastated when they find out the true workings of lives of people? <gasps> well, I never knew that. We saw that with all of the sickness of the world with that Mr. Epstein. Of all the politicians, of all the kings and queens, of all the movie stars that make tr frequent trips for their perverseness and disgustingness. And it devastated people. That's why we don't put our trust and hope in people because everyone, the Bible says, we are deceitful and above all things wicked. And without God, what father are we following? Not the heavenly father. And the devil's wicked and disgusting. But do we walk with God as a priority? Turn to me to Proverbs chapter 22. We're going to spend a few moments in Proverbs 22. In Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Here's something that we use this verse and we say, yeah. But you remember, the Jews walked it and talked it. A lot of times we train up a child, but we're saying something. How many of us all heard? Do as I say, not as I do. I mean, I've heard that. I've heard that from my bosses. You do what I say, not as I do. What does that mean? Hypocrite. What does that make us? Hypocrites. Because we're not doing what we're saying we're doing. And does that lead followership? Does that lead to followership? No. Does that lead to trust? No. Does that lead to confidence? No. That's what our politicians do. You're going to go to lockdown, I'm going to go to the cottage. You know, you're going to go to lockdown, I'm going to go to Aruba. It's, it's happening all over our country. My sister was talking about that with her politicians in the BC. They all went on holidays for Christmas. They flew off to the... Yeah, and everybody else, you stay in your home, you can't visit with your parents, you know. And they all their family met in Aruba. Wow, must be nice. Do as I say, not as I do. And what does the people say? Forget you. This is what our children will do. Proverbs 1 8. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. The mother has got a very strong law. Don't cross them off. But he's saying it's both. My son, hear the instruction of the father. And forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace under thy neck, and under thy head, and chains about thy neck. It's going to be a badge of honor. Why? Because you're looking at that's a wise person. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 was very important because Moses is light of life is fading. He's about to hand over the nation of Israel to Joshua, and he's given them a final instruction before the new, the children, the fathers and the mothers are dying off because they disobeyed God. And so we see that now, all of a sudden, guess what's happening? A transition. The young are being encouraged to step and go into Canaan land. And you know what they teach them? It's wonderful. Look at chapter 6, please. Chapter 6 and verse 6 and 7. And these words, which I have commanded thee this day, shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon their hand, and they shall be as the frontlets between their eyes, and they shall write them upon the posts of their house and on thy gates. When you walk, when you sit, when you lay down, in other words, walk what you talk. Live. 
The just shall live by faith. And this is where we've all, I've got to learn every day. I've got to remind why we're inherently dogged by the flesh. I was getting aggravated. Most of you know when I struggle with depression and anxiety. I do not like things not going my way anymore. That was not used to be the way I used to be. I was a duck. Everything just, it would irritate my wife because nothing would bother me. Now everything bothers me. Life changes. Maybe it's just because I hit over 40. You know, I don't know. I'm knocking on 50 now. Who knows? But it's like things change. My body chemicals have changed. I get aggravated really quickly. And I'm telling them all the things that's going on in my office. She's here in her office next door, so I'm just venting. And you know what she does? I can hear the tiny of the keys. She goes, must be going to be something good happening today. And the devil sure is fighting. I'm, like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I look at the negative and not the positive. The only time the devil fights when he knows there's going to be somebody coming that needs this work. And we are. God wants to keep me focused. The devil wants to keep me distracted. And as a father... He wants to destroy my home. Because if he destroyed my home, I could no longer be a preacher because I'm going to be blameless, number one, and I'm going to be ruler of my own house. Well, if I can't take care of my own life, I can't take care of God's church. Therefore, I'm disqualified. So if he can get me out of the pulpit, he's won. So therefore, I've got to protect myself even carefully, even more carefully. What does it say? If when I sit us down, when I walk us by the way, when I lie us down, when I rise us up, morning, noon, night, and midnight, and pre-dawn, keep the Lord before your children. So when they get older, they'll want to do the same thing to their children. Chapter 11, verse 19, Deuteronomy is saying almost identical. Why does God do this so much? Because he knows the home is the valuable Bastion for our society. If it wasn't so, why is the devil spend so much time telling us that it really doesn't matter if we have two moms or two dads or two this and two that? Why do they want to destroy and say, hey, kids cannot ask their mom and go get an important abortion? Why why is parents so not important? Because they are important according to God's word. It is. Oh, it's about love. Most of this world, let's be honest, is about lust. I find very little love. Because love covers the multitude of sin. And if you tell someone you're wrong, there's no love about it. There's anger and hatred and spite. Chapter 11, verse 19. And you shall teach them, your children, speaking of them, when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Almost the same thing. Notice verse 21. That your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if you shall diligently keep all these things, all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations before thee. And ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Just imagine if we say, God, if you're the God of the children of Israel like that, and if we keep your commandments and we teach your word, it's amazing what God will do for us. Amen. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If God be for me, who could be against me? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No matter what. Doesn't matter if your own family says, you know what, Grandma and Grandpa, you guys are nuts. Thank you. I'll be nuts in heaven. Mom, Dad, you just, I don't like what you're teaching me, and I'm just going, okay. Well, you know what I learned? My wife and I learned you can't outrun the prayer, prayer of parents. It is that big shepherd's hook. You think you're just around the line, all of a sudden, oh, oh. too late. God arrested you. You know, if you have made a profession of faith and you are a child of God, you can run, but you can't hide Brother Matt preached that. You can't run. I did. I ran 3,800 kilometers away from home. God still found me. Noah found God's love. Joseph 
found God's love. Jonah, he thought he'd get away and he got swallowed and spit out the shore he's supposed to go. But he found God's love. David, every person in the Bible, we see God's love. But he knows exactly where they are. God found Joseph at the bottom of the pit. He says, I got a purpose for you, young man. Our children will choose a community. This was on a post of a pastor friend of mine, Brother Grubbs. If all they do is attend church, but their real community is a ball team, cheering squad, or social club, or a group of friends from school, then don't be surprised when they eventually separate themselves from church. The community is usually established very early in life, and they are watching very closely where your community is also. Second of all, what you see, instruction and wisdom. We need wisdom today, don't we? Yeah. Common sense is dead. Put a fork in it, cook it, barbecue it, it's done. There is no common sense. I just, I, I look at what the news says sometimes and social media says sometimes, and I'm like, huh? I mean, you think about all the restrictions. If this really was a uniform restriction in the entire world, do you realize in the continent of Africa, they're only allowed by who? Three feet apart? I've seen signs. I've seen missionaries in Africa post what they put on the church, and it says one meter. Why are we two? Are Canadians more contagious? Or do we spit farther? I don't know. <laughs> and, and if one mask works, why do we need two? And if I'm vaccinated, and I'm not, why do I need to continue wearing a mask? If this is supposed to cure it. And then if I'm vaccinated, why do you need to wear a mask? How am I get something from you? And how am I trying? I just have to pull my hair out. I don't have any left. Because it lacks common sense. And I've asked people, if this is such a dangerous pandemic, I was a first responder firefighter during when the AIDS heightened. And we had protocol to do with our gloves and our masks when we had any bodily fluid. And we could not touch the sides of our trucks. We had kick plates. And we had to take them off and put them in a hazmat container. Mm -hmm. Hazmat. Mm -hmm. Gloves. Mask. And guess what? We had masks fitted for us. My bandana is not a mask, I'm sorry. It's a t-shirt that's glorified, sewed together, and it's, it's great. When I can still spit and fill it, I've tried it, trust me. I'm that dumb. And I still, you know, folks, this is the thing. Common sense is lacking. Look at some other things. Wisdom is all throughout the Bible and is so needed in the world today, especially godly wisdom as it will lead us on the path of God. I see it in our homes. The things parents teach the kids. I'm like, what? Common sense, folks. Teach them to figure a problem out. Don't solve the problem for them. If you solve all their problems, when they get older, they're not going to, what are we our world today? I was kidding, and I was introducing myself and my family, or my wife, my family was not with me, it was uh, one of the rare times my wife and I had a week alone, and I was introduced, I said, I'm Gordon Hart, and this is my wife of 28 years, and I said, I thank the Lord for her, but I have one beef against her, every Monday morning she doesn't give my hot chocolate, my coloring book, and my blankie, and my resignation papers, and it's like, Everybody has a problem and they want to go get their coloring book and get their safe space and have a hot chocolate a latte and cry about it. Do you know how many times in the ministry toughness comes? And if I were to quit, I would have quit a thousand times over. But God brought me for Esther 414 in 2006 of May 1st for such a time as this. You know what that means? It's not going to be easy to it's not going to mean that my feelings are always going to be coddled. They're going to be stepped on. They're going to be kicked to the curb. They're going to be cursed. They're going to do everything else. And the devil's going to make sure that I'm going to be discouraged. How much more is he going to do it as a father? He wants you to quit. But common sense tells us we can't afford to quit. There is too much at stake. The lives of your children and grandchildren, the lives of your husband, your wife, are essential 
to this community and to this world. Matter of fact, wisdom is so much mentioned, it's mentioned 234 times in the Bible. 149 times, it means in good sense, skillful and wisely, good wit. 49 times in his extreme intelligence. I think that left. But look with me. Verse 7. Go back to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. And verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. It stops right there with a beautiful little thought. Wisdom is the principal thing. Semicolon. Semicolon. Therefore, get wisdom. <laughs> If you don't have wisdom, you're a fool. What is the opposite of wise? Foolish. Yeah. Folks, and I raised both hands and all my ten toes to say I've been foolish in my life. Mm -hmm. I've made some dumb decisions. And that's just BC for saying we're dumb. Thank you. you know, there's no smoothing that one over. I was just dumb. Because why? I didn't think or I didn't want to think. I didn't count the cost. I didn't weigh it up. To see, if I follow this dumb path, I'm going to get a dumb result. Hello? I, I can't smooth it over anything. And it's, I cannot go to the site. It's my parents' fault. I didn't keep, it's my fault. I'm the idiot. Who did it? My dad says, don't touch the stove. It's hot. <laughs> ah! You know what my dad said? I told you so. <laughs> I'm six years old and I put my hand on those little grates. Why? I don't know. I guess I wanted to see if it hot. It was hot. I couldn't move my fingers for a couple weeks. Why? It burnt the snot out of them. My dad? Hold yourself. <laughs> Go see mom. She'll put some first aid on it. You may remember first aid. It was from Norway and it was all fish oil. It stunk. But it worked. And it was called first aid. I think it was fish aid or something. I don't know. It was bad. But I hated that. I'd rather much have honey now. But needless to say, my dad did not say, oh, son, I'm so sorry. Told you so. He told me. But who was the ignorant one? Who was the dumb one? It wasn't him. I don't know how many times he said, don't touch it. That will burn and that will... Same with the tea kettle. Don't put your hand on the side of the tea kettle. Don't put your hand in front of the steam. I would always see him put a rag over the radiator cap. We don't have much of that problem, but we used to have. Why did he do that? And he said, step back real fast, because that's hot. He taught me common sense, and if I didn't listen to it, it's no one to blame but me. Wisdom. But today, fathers are not investing in their children to say, don't do this. Don't do that. Do this. I'll do what I want to do. You won't tell me what to do. Okay. Don't blame him. Don't blame your mom when things fail for you. Because you are at fault. I read a book years ago, The Vanishing Conscience, it was written in the 1980s by John MacArthur in a counseling course. One of the best books. He says, when we do not want to repent for our failures, we will never get repentance from God. If we blame everybody else for our problem, oh, it's Neil's fault. If Neil hadn't been there, I wouldn't have done that. If Ray wasn't there, I, I can't blame Neil and Ray. It was my fault. Then you go, you're going to do this. No. Most of the time it's, here, have a drink. Oh, come on, you sissy. Come on, have a drink. I can still say no all I want. Call you sissy all I want. But you know what I did? And that started something I wish I never did. Pure pressure. Because we don't want to stand up for right. What's words going to do? They hurt? Yep. We're going to speak about that in a second. Proverbs 10 1. Look at Proverbs 10 1. Just read the book of Proverbs and you'll see. You will see so much wisdom. Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. The mother takes the brunt of it. You notice that? Yes. The mothers are an emotional, wonderful creature. And they grieve over their sons and daughters' mistakes. The fathers, sometimes we put them in our little compartment and we're done. But the moms can't let it go. Years ago, it got me when my mom told me on the phone, son, I'm praying that 
God would take my life to get you right. I'm doing it. My dad never said anything like that. My dad said, I'm praying for you, son. You know what's right. But when my mom said that, every son and daughter loves their mom implicitly. It's just that thing mom gives their kids. But when she says, I'm praying for you, I'm taking home. Boy, that just hit. No one wants to lose their mom. Verse 13, 1. A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Proverbs 15, 5. A foolish, a fool despises his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. We're smart when we take rebuke, amen? Yeah. We've all, I've learned some great things by a boss who had to chide me first. I did some things wrong. And he had to sit down, but he didn't know how to be politically correct, he goes, stupidity will get you killed. And I'm working with 14,400 volts in my hand. And I reached over this way to grab something. And my gloves only come to here. What's bare here? Skin. Oh. And he said, don't you ever reach over and grab something. Because it could be your last. He got all over me. He jumped, but you know what? It stuck. And every time I start, ah! okay. you have to rethink about how, you know, it's, it's easy to reach over and pull this because this is your dominant hand or this one, depending if you're left or right. And you reach things. And he had to remind me, pull with your dominant hand first and then grab with this one. Never hold it and then reach it and wrench it. Because you can die. It takes exactly 11 seconds to electrocute yourself at 14,000 volts. Oh. Done. And he said, stupid mistakes cause lives to die. I thought about that over and over. Stupid mistakes. We can't change. They can affect us one way or another. All throughout the Word of God, we see Proverbs is the book of wisdom and it's imperative that we live it and teach it for our children. Finally, this morning, instruction in words. Notice what Proverbs 4 says. Let thy heart retain my words. Verse 23, or actually, let's go to verse 20. My son. Tend to my words, incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are life unto those that find them, health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Instruction in words. We need to instruct our children how to talk. I think vocabulary and true sentencing is gone. If we took out all the curse words out of our society, everybody would speak a third or less. Why do we need curse words to make something sound better? It actually makes it sound ignorant. You know, you just delete it and you might find some sentence in there. But I mean, you look at people's text messages and you're like, you read some Facebook posts and you're like, huh? Wow. It's better not to say anything. How do people respond? I, I mean, for giggles sometimes, I read what people respond with. And I'm like, I wouldn't even offer that guy an intelligent answer. And yet people want to debate. We call them keyboard warriors. We've all heard that. They would never debate you to your face, but they will sit in their basement somewhere and they'll debate you. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 3. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. Oh, wow, that's a good one. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But, the, but he that opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Sometimes I wish I never opened my mouth. I was goaded and I was babied and I felt like I had to defend myself. Sometimes it's better to let God fight your battles for you. Because those words, and you know what I found out? 
people love to read in emails and letters. They will read. Well, I know that's their tone. No, you don't know that's your tone. How many of my times my family has taken what I've said on text and blown it out of proportion? You know what I do? Hello! Yeah. You hear my tone, my voice, bro? I am not that. But if you want me to be, I will be. You know? We don't know. And it's like, really, bro? What are you doing? So many times I want to articulate my words. And when I'm aggravated, I best not articulate my words because it's not going to come out right. So I have to let it cool down. And like what it says here, carefully keep your words. Look with me in chapter 23 and verse 13. Proverbs 23, 13. Actually, uh, verse 9. Speak not in the ears of fools, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. You know, if someone's not interested in hearing what you have to say, don't tell them because he's not going to listen anyway. Right. Despise the wisdom of thy words. I have learned that there are less and less people I even talk to today because they're not going to want the truth. You can put the truth on black and white. You can put every intelligent university doctor or this in front of it, and they're like, I don't believe it. Whatever. But it doesn't change the fact the truth is the truth, amen? Proverbs 15 and verse 4. Proverbs 15, verse 1 and then verse 4. A soft answer turn away wrath, but a grievous word stir up anger. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. All of this is about words and tongues. It's important. Chapter 16, verse 24. What does the Bible say here? Pleasant words are as honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. Pleasant words. Remember your mama? If you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. <coughs> Still didn't work. I love to call my brother all sorts of names. <laughs> if you don't have, we even heard it on Bambi, I believe it was. You know, ingrained, if you don't have something nice, don't say it at all. Really, what what did it do? Did it make it feel better? Probably. <coughs> was it constructive? Nope. Was it destructive? Yes. Words make a person ignorant, foolish, or wise and articulate. Do we want to be, as parents, wise and articulate? Thinking about how we form our words and say it. Or we say it out of a rash, a hasty mind. All throughout the Word of God, Psalms 39 1. I'll read this last one and I'll read some quotes for you this morning. Psalms 39 1. This touched my heart this week as I was reading. This was in one of my devotionals. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace, even for good, and my sorrow was stirred. I will take heed to my ways. In other words, you just want to think about that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. You know what the wicked wants to do? Take everything you and I say and twist it. So you know what? Don't give them any ammunition. One of my professors said, when they put the, point the gun loaded at you, give it back a gun loaded. Tell them to click all they want. You know what makes a person angry even more? is when you say nothing. Did you hear what I called you? <laughs> Did you not? Mm -hmm. I did. Well, what are you going to say about it? I made the mistake one time. It says it didn't deserve a response. <laughs> that didn't go over very well because that was just saying, just don't say anything. And if you walk off, boy, as my dad would say, it frosted their cake. You know, it frosted them. It made them mad. 
don't give a fool a minute. All they want is a fight. Don't give it to them. My dad used to say, it takes a bigger man to walk away from a fight. It does. You know why? Because the flesh sometimes. Some people deserve it. They really do. But is that what God wants us to do? There are times I believe we ought to fight. Rather be, I believe we ought to fight for our freedoms. I believe we ought to fight for our family. And right now, we're in a fight for our lives. Yeah. The devil wants to destroy our family. And fathers, we're in the front line. Words are free. It's how you use them that may cost. Be careful with your words, fathers. Once they are said, they can only be forgiven and not forgotten. Words can inspire and words can destroy. Choose yours well. Michael Hyatt says, our words have power. They impact others, but they also impact us. Choose wisely. We're all guilty of not teaching the articulation of words. We're all guilty of being fools with our lips. But today, I'm glad God's word would remind me that I need to be more careful. Because I have people watching me. So do you. As we get older, I know one day at the Lord Terry's God will give me grandkids. I will have to watch what I say. Do you know what Grandpa said? <laughs> I can just hear that now. You know, but our kids did the same thing. Why? Because I heard it in Sunday school. Pray for my mom and dad. <laughs> Be careful. Watch our words. Teach them instruction in words, instruction in wisdom, and instruction in the word of God. And then pray, pray, pray. Don't ever stop praying. Live it for them. Be consistent. Because your Heavenly Father is the example for you. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. Thank you for all you've blessed us with. Continue to lead, guide, and direct in all that's said and done. Lord, work in our hearts. Help us to be diligent in all that we do and say. Help us to be mindful of our words. Help us to be teachers of the word and instructors of wisdom. To our grandchildren, O Lord, that we may pass on a generation that we will stand for God all of their days. Equip us, O Lord, for the days ahead, that we may go forward in faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring us back tonight at 5 o'clock, O Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be able to at least broadcast this morning that the message you can go out to all that are online and join with us as well. Thank you for your love for us wisdom to work around circumstances and problems. We give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every one tonight at 5 o'clock. Don't forget on the front foyer um, that I have left uh, cards for each one of the fathers. And please take one and enjoy a couple of coffees on us. And uh, may the Lord bless you. Be faithful to the Lord all the days of your life. Lord bless and have a great day.